Paul DeCord is Commonwealth versus Lindsay Clancy on indictment 2383CR00198. Uh, Counsel for the record, could you please state your name for purposes of the record? Kevin Spray, Commonwealth. Amanda Powell for Commonwealth. Kevin Bradington for Ms. Clancy, who's before the court. Thank you. Uh, Lindsay Clancy, the grand jury having returned on indictment 2383CR00198 on offense 001. The jurors for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts on their oath present that Lindsay Clancy of Duxbury in the County of Plymouth on or about January 24th, 2023 at Duxbury in the County of Plymouth did assault and beat Cora Clancy with the intent to murder her and by such assault and beating did kill and murder said Cora Clancy on offense 001 on the charge of murder. How do you plead guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. On offense 002, for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts on their oath present that Lindsay M. Clancy of Duxbury in the County of Plymouth on or about January 24th, 2023 at Duxbury in the County of Plymouth did assault and beat Dawson Clancy with intent to murder him and by such assault and beating did kill and murder the said Dawson Clancy on offense 002 on the charge of murder. How do you plead guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. On offense 003, the jurors for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts on their oath present that Lindsay M. Clancy of Duxbury in the County of Plymouth, on or about January 24th, 2023, at Duxbury in the County of Plymouth, did assault and beat Callan Clancy with intent to murder him, and by such assault and beating did kill and murder said Callan Clancy on offense 003 on the charge of murder. How do you plead guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. I believe we can wait to get the rest. On offenses 004, 005, and 006, all charging strangulation or suffocation of another person. How do you plead guilty or not guilty? Okay. Thank you. Yes, the facts of this case and the penalty. As to the facts, Your Honor, on Tuesday, January 24th, 2023, Lindsay Clancy, the defendant before you, interacted with many people both in person and over the phone without any problems or causes of concern. She was able to take her five year old daughter, Cora, to the pediatrician. She was able to play with Cora and Dawson, three-year-old son, in the backyard that day. She was able to take care of Callan Clancy, her eight-month-old child, without any problems or concerns that day. She was also able to call CDS, or local CDS manager there, for, the, for uh, Cora, um, without any problems. Um, she was able to select a place for dinner online, a uh, three-week restaurant. Um, she was able to uh, communicate that to her. Without any problems, she was able to call the restaurant, um, place the correct order, give her husband's name, give her husband's phone number without any problem. Um, she was also able to check Apple Maps, where she was able to determine how long it would take her husband to get from her house to the restaurant and back, so she would know how long he would be gone approximately. She then sent her husband off to CVS with medication and to the restaurant. Patrick left the house that evening at 5 15 p.m. He said goodbye to his wife, he kissed his children. He returned home at 6.09 p.m. He was only gone for 54 minutes. Defendant's phone shows that while Patrick was at CVS, he called Lindsay at 5.33 p.m. and she didn't answer the phone. She called him back at 5.34 p.m. and he said the conversation was fine. Uh, they were discussing medication, so she did seem like she was in the middle of something. Now, surveillance footage shows that um, Patrick got off the phone and went to the register and checked out at about 5.37 p.m. He then went to the restaurant while he's seen on here or there. He leaves the restaurant at 5.35 p.m. <coughs> Immediately after the phone call from Patrick, um, Lindsay Clancy's fitness app on her watch, which is in the message of her phone, shows that she went up three flights. There's, in her home, there was the finished basement level, the first floor level, which is the living area, and then the second floor level, which the, the bedroom area where her bedroom was. Um, and it shows that she went up those three flights immediately after the phone call um, from where she spoke with her husband. Um, when Patrick arrived home, the first thing he noticed was silence, which was unusual with three small children in the house. He did not see or hear the defendant or the children. He called her at 6.09 p.m., called Lindsay, and uh, she didn't answer. So he went upstairs to their bedroom, which was locked. Um, he was able to unlock it, and when he went inside, he saw that there were uh, blood drops on the floor in front of a folding mirror. There was an open window. There was um, what appeared to be a bloody knife on a nightstand next to um, a wine tumbler, tumbler that read, um, because kids. Um, he then went outside and found 
Clancy on the ground um, underneath the window um, that she had gone out of. Um, she had cuts on her wrist and neck that were no longer actively bleeding. Um, he called 911 and they, and they asked him to put pressure on it. The wound, she, he said it wasn't necessary because they weren't bleeding. Um, she told him that the kids were in the basement, according to Patrick Clancy. When EMS arrived, yeah, asked him to stay with her, and he went into the house. The 911 call kept going. And in the 911 call, you can hear Patrick Clancy go into the house, go down the basement stairs, and we know he went to the right first, which is where the exercise room and the home office were, because you hear him screaming. And you hear him say, Dawson, and my buddy. And um, he takes the exercise band from around Dawson's neck, and then he goes to the other side of the basement where there's a den. And you hear him find Cora, and he screams, baby, and uh, he's screaming. Then you can hear when he finds Callan, um, because the, the pain in his voice gets even worse. He, the emergency people come downstairs, all the police, the firefighters, um, yells, she killed the kids. They're able to uh, get to the children, get them into ambulances, bring them to the hospital. Or in Dawson are declared this at the hospital, they died from asphyxiation. Uh, Callan was med flighted to Boston Children's Hospital because they were able to get a pulse, um, but unfortunately he was brain dead and he got off life support several days later and died from complications from asphyxiation. Uh, the defendant was transported to South Shore Hospital um, and then later to Brigham and Women's Hospital. She sustained broken uh, ribs, um, some broken bones in her back, and a spinal cord transection at the T5, T6 level. She also had um, minor scratches on her wrist and neck. On each wrist, there were scratches and um, a couple small puncture wounds. Um, she did not split her wrists or slice them open, and the puncture wounds were not connected in any way. Um, on her neck, there were scratches and one small cut that did not require stitches. The police were able to find several notebooks in the defendant's home um, to, pursuant to a search warrant um, that she used as journals as well as some notes on her phone. Um, and they detailed the, the months, weeks, and days leading up to this incident. Um, she details her life, her children's lives, uh, her mental state, what medication she was taking. Um, her writing was clear and precise and articulate. Um, in one journal, she's even leaving notes for the nanny um, her two older children were going to school four days a week and they had a nanny to help with the baby. And she wrote, wrote very clear and detailed instructions for the nanny um, in that journal. Um, in these notes and journals, she always appears to know who she is, where she is, what's going on, what's happening. Uh, there are no disordered thoughts or speech, um, no mention of hallucination or um, any delusions. Um, she did write the day before killing her children um, that she had, quote, a touch of postpartum anxiety, end quote, around returning to work. Um, she talks about her psychiatrist pres prescribing medication to help her. Um, she was initially diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder. She was then evaluated at Women and Infant Center for Women's Behavioral Health in Rhode Island, um, who determined that she did not appear to have postpartum depression and told her to seek the help of a generalized psychologist. Um, she wrote in her journal that she had suicidal ideation at time in December of 2022. Uh, she told her husband she had thoughts of harming herself and on one occasion of harming the children, but she did not write those thoughts or voice those thoughts again after a brief stay at McLean Hospital. Uh, she had called her treating uh, therapist when she had those thoughts and had herself admitted to McLean Hospital on January 1st, 2023. Um, she was discharged from the hospital on January 5th. When she was discharged, the hospital did not file any paperwork attempting uh, to have her committed as a danger to herself or others. When she was discharged, she denied having any auditory or visual hallucinations. She denied any homicidal or suicidal thoughts. Um, she also kept a pretty detailed um, medication diary. Where she detailed the medication she was taking and the dosages and what was prescribed to her. Um, and if she had any issues with each medication, she detailed how her doctors would take her off that medication or wean her off if there was an issue. She was never on more than four to five medications at a time. Um, and at the time of the murder, she was taking, uh, she was prescribed three uh, medications. Uh, according to her journal and notes, she was taking medications as prescribed. Uh, Dr. Dow, DAU, um, a psychiatrist retained by the Commonwealth, reviewed the defendant's medical records, um, prescription history, her journals, 
um, and didn't find anything out of the ordinary in the manner of treatment or in the medications that were prescribed to her by her providers. Uh, she testified at grand jury that the trial of different medications and different combinations and dosages is uh, routine medical practice when initially treating a patient and trying to find out what works for them. Uh, Dr. Dow also reviewed the South Shore Hospital, uh, Mass State Police Crime Lab, and NMS Lab's toxicology analysis of the defendant's blood that was taken from her at 8.18 p.m. on January 24, 2023, uh, the day of the incident at South Shore Hospital. Uh, Dr. Dow explained that um, a therapeutic level of medication is the level that's helpful to a patient but not toxic and not below the level where it wouldn't have any effect. Um, the defendant's uh, blood work showed she had the following medications in her system. Amitriptyline, which is an antidepressant. The level was unknown as it was only detected by South Shore Hospital. And what Dr. Dow testified to was that different labs have different thresholds um, and the drug level has to meet that threshold in order to show a positive. So it only showed a positive at South Shore Hospital. Um, Ativan, which is a sedative, she had 61 nanograms per milliliter in her system. The therapeutic level for that drug is between 50 and 240 nanograms. So the defendant was at the low end of the therapeutic level. She had Valium, which is another sedative. She had 28.8 nanograms per milliliter. Um, the therapeutic level for this drug is between 200 and 2,500 nanograms. And so she was at the very low end uh, for that medication of the therapeutic level. She had Lamictal, which is an anticonvulsant um, in her system, 6.1 milligrams per milliliter, and that was at a therapeutic level. Um, she had Trazodone, an antidepressant and sedative in her system. That level was 0 0.44 milligrams per milliliter. So that was below the therapeutic level um, where it wouldn't be expected to have an effect on her at all. She had Remeron, an antidepressant in her system at 200 nanograms per milliliter. Um, this was at the um, therapeutic level of a high dose. And then the final item uh, was the only one that was at a toxic level, which is Seroquel, 1800 nanograms per milliliter. And uh, Dr. Dow explained these results to the grand jury. She said that um, the defendant had therapeutic levels of Ativan and Valium in her system. She had a low level of Trazodone in her system that indicated she had taken that dose the previous night. Um, the defendant also had therapeutic levels of Lamictal and, and Amitriptyline in her blood work. The two medications that were present at a higher level, uh, the doctor explained that they were at peak levels in her blood, which would mean that she took those that medication approximately two hours before the blood was drawn at 8.15 p.m., which would um, put that around 6 p.m. Uh, this would mean that the defendant took this large amount of Remeron and Seroquel um, after she killed her children. We know this because she went upstairs at approximately 5.35 p.m. after the phone call with her husband. Um, her fitness app shows her going up those stairs. It does not show her going up those stairs again. So she remained on that level. Her husband left at 5.15 p.m. She brought the children to the basement and killed them, took a phone call, explained, answered his questions without any problem, and then went upstairs to her room. Um, also reinforcing this is that um, Patrick Quincy returned home at 6.09 p.m. and the event was already on the ground in the backyard. According to Dr. Dow, the medications present in the defendant's blood could have the following effects on a person's body at those levels, uh, drowsiness, confusion, sedation, hypertension, loss of coordination, seizures, or coma. She testified that the two worst things that could happen with these medications would be cardiac arrest or coma. She was asked if these medications and this amount, these amounts could cause a person to become violent. She said no. She was asked if these amounts could cause um, psychosis, if there were any studies that showed that they could cause psychosis. Uh, she said no. Um, there was a uh, two case studies that detailed experience with Remeron, but those are just two individual patients self-reporting um, that um, there were no case, formal case studies on. Um, Seroquel, the, the one that she had the highest amount of, is actually an antipsychotic medication prescribed to treat or prevent psychosis. So it would clearly not cause psychosis. On the night of the killings, Patrick Clancy was interviewed by the police at the hospital. He told the police that the defendant was having one of her best days. She was smiling and happy. There was no indication she was going to harm the kids. And no one described her as acting like a zombie in the days leading up to the murders or on the day of the murders themselves. Um, she consistently denied hearing voices or any having any type of visual or audio auditory hallucinations to all of her treatment providers leading up to this incident. The first time she used psychosis was when she was with the doctor hired by the defense and using his phone to call her husband from the hospital. This was the first time she told someone she heard a voice. 
She has denied hearing this voice and is killing her children. The defendant wrote a note on her phone on October 25th, 2022, stating, I think I sort of resent my other children because they prevent me from treating Cal like my first baby. She also wrote, I want to feel love and connection with all of my kids. This would indicate that she did not feel love or connection with at least some of her kids. Um, she then wrote, she wants to have more kids eventually. <laughs> Four days prior to killing her children, the defendant did an internet search on her phone, and it was, quote, can you treat a sociopath? The children were killed with uh, ligature strangulation. Um, ligature strangulation causes the victim to become unconscious anywhere from 10 seconds to a minute. And that depends on how much the victim struggles or fights. The more they struggle or fight, the longer it takes. Dawson had the most protective eye on his face and neck. According to the medical examiner, this means Dawson either struggled or fought for his life more than Cora or Callum were able to, or that she strangled him harder than the other two, or both. And it takes 10 pounds of pressure, at minimum, to strangle. After the victim becomes unconscious, the ligature has to be held in place with that same force for an additional four to five minutes. She had to strangle the kids to unconsciousness and then keep strangling them for additional minutes. She could have stopped at any time. She could have changed her mind at any time. She could have helped them at any time. She did not. Instead, she finished strangling the children, returned her husband's phone call, then went up to the bedroom on the second floor. There she used the knife to inflict superficial cuts and scratches to her wrist and neck. She took the remaining pills of the Remeron and Seracol, and then she climbed out of the bedroom window and gripped the windowsill while dangling from it. We know this because there's blood on the outside of the windowsill where her wrist would be in her hand. She then dropped from the window or slid down. She did not jump. She did not hurl herself out of the window because there are blood, there's blood on the exterior shingles going down the yeah, exterior of the house. And then on the window, directly below the window she came out of, there's more blood on the top level, um, looking like she tried to grab onto that window sill. So she lowered herself out the window and dropped down. I don't think she took into account the fact the ground was frozen. The defendant did not take advantage of the situation when her husband went out that night. She created She used Apple Maps to make sure she'd have enough time to do what she wanted to do to the kids. Um, before her husband returned. While being treated at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston after killing her children, the defendant spoke to medical staff. On February 6th, she said that she had fears that her inability to walk would make her vulnerable to others, and that she was worried about not being able to walk again. On February 7th, she said she was feeling more hopeful about her future. On February 8th, she stated that she is more future-oriented and hopeful. And on February 9th, she is visibly engaged, energized, and hopeful. She is a danger to herself and others. She planned these murders. She gave herself the time and privacy to commit these murders. <coughs> and she killed these children in their home where they should have been safe. She did so with deliberate premeditation and extreme atrocity and cruelty. At least as far as February, she was showing no remorse in these people. But that's the you hold her without Thank you. Uh, Serenity? Yes, Thank you. First of all, uh, as you're more likely is aware, um, Ms. Clancy is a nurse, um, obviously a wife, mother. According to anybody that you speak to prior to this incident, she was nothing less than a marvelous, incredible mother housewife. Um, I've been in that house. There are photographs that show the love and devotion that both Lindsay and her husband Patrick had these kids. Every single room was covered with her artwork, uh, embroidery, pictures, statements for the kids, uh, charts and graphs of you know how they're doing or what they're doing as far as learning, alphabet, numbers, things of that nature. Um, she then, after having the third child, obviously, and I understand that the government wants to portray lack of criminal responsibility as somebody who is uh, crazy, as we would envision somebody being crazy, unable to speak, 
unable to take care of themselves with hygiene, uh, acting in a very, very irrational fashion. But that's not what happens when you have a situation as here. Where you have a woman who is obviously suffering from postpartum depression. And how do we know that? Well, we know that because in the weeks and months prior, she was in such a state. She was unable to emote. She was unable to feel. She had no ability to love, whether it was her husband or her kids, and she told Patrick, her husband, that. After the war, she went to the doctors and told the doctors that she was acting as a zombie. And it's interesting that the government was able to get medical records from these doctors as soon as they snapped their fingers. I had to file a Rule 17 in the district court. They sent out the order to the doctors. Some of them responded. Interestingly enough, the ones that were prescribing the medication, they lawyered up. They wouldn't even talk to me. I got letters from lawyers, most unprofessional, telling me, do not talk to my client. And then when my when my office manager, Laura Mather, was reaching out to these people, asking the lawyer, where are these records? He didn't even return the phone call. Not once, not twice, but three times. So now the grand jury has the medical records. But I was finally able to get the Rhode Island Hospital record. One appointment. It's a joke. One appointment she has. And they say, oh, no, she doesn't have that postpartum. No, she doesn't have the symptoms of postpartum. But she was in such a state as a result of the postpartum as well as the medication that she was on that her husband had to have her mother and father and his mother and father basically stay at the house for weeks, perhaps a month prior, because she was unable to function. And he had to work. He worked out of the house, but he also had to leave the house. So this is the condition that she was in at the time leading up. And, and, and she was taking these diaries because she was told by her doctors to be very, very accurate, right in the journal, what medication you're on, how much, what's the dose, what if any reaction do you have? And she was faithful to that. She's an intelligent woman, she's a registered nurse, she knew how to take notes in a journal. That does not mean or indicate that she was not suffering because obviously she was having problems with the medication as a result of which they told her to keep a journal. And it's the same thing as Patrick going to the doctor and telling the doctor she's a zombie, and the parents staying with them to help to take care of the kids. And the fact that that day she was able to talk, communicate, build snowmen with her kids, talk to her husband, make plans to have dinner, go out and get the dinner. This is not some nefarious plan where she's gonna Google how long it's gonna take to drive to a restaurant that they've been to, that they know where it is, that she's planning, and, and as a result of that, she then speaks to him. So I guess she must have been fine because she was able to communicate with her husband about the purchases of the items at the, in the drugstore. <clears throat> when I was in the house, I was able to see the blood that was on the floor, on the wall, on the window of the ledge. And it was uh, fairly copious. It's not some kind of little superficial, little dinky, little scratch on her wrist and on her neck. There was blood, it looked like arterial spray, actually, because it was on the floor, droplets all over it, and as I say, on the wall and on the, on the window. She fell out the window, obviously, not anticipating that she's going to, in some fashion, slide down the house and pretend that, she's, uh, that she was suicidal. She obviously hit the ground, transecting her spine, notwithstanding, for months, the police making comments in the news media, you're in the government arguing with them. Uh, and, and in good faith, I would never suggest that, that these, these attorneys would ever misrepresent something. But everybody was thinking it like, oh, she, she should be fine. She'll be fine. She's not going to be fine. She's permanently paralyzed. Dr. Philip Resnick, who is a world-renowned psychiatrist, has examined her and is on our team. Um, Dr. Paul Zizel is sitting here, uh, has been with us on this matter from the very beginning. Once uh, I get involved with the case, with the family. She obviously had no reason to kill those three beautiful children. You have to ask yourself, why? Why? And when you ask yourself why, and you consider all of these factors, it's readily apparent, I suggest, Judge, that this woman was a troubled soul. 
So when the case goes to trial, I believe she has a very, very, very good defense, a very strong case. But we know that she is a dangerous counsel to Greece, to herself, uh, and perhaps others. I don't personally, I don't, I don't see danger to others, but she's certainly a danger. So she's been hospitalized, as you know, um, from South Shore Hospital. She went to the Brigham of Women. She was a Brigham of Women's in the Lockwood. She had police officers stationed outside her door. Then from Brigham of Women, she went to Spalding Rehab. Spalding Rehab, uh, and now here we are in Tewksbury with the Department of Mental Health. All this thing has filed under 18A, 123-18A, indicating that she needs hospitalization. It does not need jail. It does not need Framingham or, or Plymouth House of Correction. I do believe, and Your Honor is aware, that uh, she has been evaluated uh, by the court uh, clinician. I, I fully expect that DMH will file a request under 18A, ultimately seeking that she be uh, held here pending trial. So I'm asking that you not hold her with her. As far as holding without bail, but um, with an order of the court that she would reside here at Tewksbury Hospital. Is there, is there been a petition filed um, <coughs> in regards to the. I think that there was an evaluation this morning, right? Yes. Um, I just don't know. Uh, Under 18A and a half, I can. We can have a hearing in regards to the need to commit her is an allegation of serious harm to herself. And so the doctor has, the clinician has interviewed her? Yes. And is she prepared to, uh, what do we know? Uh, she's on. She's on. Oh, yes, Dr. Your Honor. All right, Dr. Gus, I'm sorry, I couldn't tell uh, who was it. So, did you have an opportunity to um, interview uh, Ms. Clancy today? I did, Your Honor. I, I interviewed her via Zoom earlier this morning. Okay. Can you tell me what your um, the results of that uh, interview? Yes, Your okay. Honor. Um, so, Dr. Karen Towers, court clinician, designated forensic psychologist. Um, I did, I did meet with Ms. Clancy via Zoom earlier today. I had previously had a brief conversation with um, her social worker from Tewksbury Hospital yesterday. Um, and I'm aware that uh, the clinicians at Tewksbury believe that she does require continued hospitalization at this time. I also did review the Section 18A evaluation that was completed at the hospital in um, dated April 26th of this year. Uh, following her initial commitment there under Section 18A for evaluation. Uh, when I met with her this morning, uh, she reported to me that she continues to uh, have feelings of depression. She reported feeling unbearably depressed, struggling to get through each day. She presented with flat affect, uh, little to no emotional expression. She did report that she has been experiencing intrusive thoughts and flashbacks on a daily basis. She's had difficulty sleeping, poor appetite. She indicated that she continues to experience feelings of hopelessness and worthlessness. She reported to me that she does have ongoing daily thoughts of suicide, although no specific plan in place, uh, but she, does, she indicated she has thought about ways that she might try to harm herself. Um, she did not present as overtly psychotic. She didn't present with any overt delusional ideation, denied any current experience of hallucinations, uh, but again, did did present with and did report ongoing feelings of depression, anxiety, hopelessness, worthlessness, suicidal ideation. Uh, based on her current presentation, which is consistent with uh, my understanding of how she has presented during the course of her hospitalization at Tewksbury, it is my opinion that she uh, does require ongoing psychiatric hospitalization. She indicated to me that she remains on one-to-one -one observation status due to ongoing concerns about her risk of harm to herself. Um, so I would recommend further, further uh, hospitalization pursuant to Section 18A. I have been informed uh, that in the event the court is inclined to remand her to DMH custody at Tewksbury Hospital under Section 18A, uh, if there are no objections from any of the parties, 
Tewksbury would agree to accept her as a straight 18A commitment for a period not to exceed six months without the need for additional 30-day evaluation. Uh, so the hospital is prepared to do that should, should there be no uh, objections by any of the parties. Otherwise, the court could certainly order her there for another evaluation under 18A for the 30-day period of evaluation. All right, Dr. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Your Honor. Right, well, I, I'm going to make a finding that Ms. Clancy is a serious risk of imminent and serious self-harm. Uh, so I'm going to make that finding. Um, and so is there any objection if I order a commitment under 18A for the uh, extended period rather than 30 days? Come on. Yeah. Right. Is that it? Oh, of course not. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to uh, issue that so she will be held without bail, without prejudice. Uh, she will be committed under uh, 18A uh, got relating to the findings that I made. Okay. Thank you. And, uh, do we have a next date? We do, and I just wanted to file a formal statement of facts sure. and our first notice of discovery, and I have a copy for it. Um, are you ready to keep the November 30th date? Or no, you know, I'm excited to be a little, um, so now that we don't have to have that constraint, um, yeah, how about uh, We asked, can I ask for a February date? I would ask for something earlier. I want to keep discovery on track. Yeah, why don't we do that? We can, we can waive the defendant's appearance and just pick a date just because it sounds like there's going to be some okay, so in discovery. But, um, I'm going to be with you on the Gallagher Barricade December 13th, so that would be for at least a week. So, in the afternoon, perhaps. Call it any of those days that week for you? Any day that week is fine. We'll do it a little bit later towards the end of the week. So we're dealing yep. with a payment. Sure. Uh, that Wednesday, Thursday. Oh, so that's a Wednesday. Oh, that's a Wednesday. We're going to go into the next. Okay. Do you want to say uh, 15th? It's Friday. Fine. All right. So this battle will be continued to December 15th. And it's present waived on that day. So we'll see the parties. Thank you. Very good. Right. Thank you, Lindsay Clancy, on this indictment. Uh, the court orders that you held without bail. Uh, this will be said without prejudice, and that uh, you're going to be under the EPA uh, agreement as uh, by the parties. Matters can be continued to uh, 12 15 23 at 2 o'clock. Implement. Thank you. 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 Thank you.